Welcome to this segment of Ask Me Anything. It's our new year edition, our, our new year kind of calling in a better year. You know, we have been grappling with so much um, from our time in 2020 that hopefully you're feeling a sense of relief and maybe a sense of renewed, you know, purpose and even optim you know, cautious optimism, just having this chance to, to kind of reset and recharge and um, kind of reorient back into school and work and everything else that is on our plates right now. Um, in this in this issue or this edition of Ask Me Anything, I'm going to be tackling some tough questions that folks have been, you know, sharing with me. Smart, dedicated, big-hearted parents just like you. And why do I know that about you? Because you're here. Because <laughs> you made it. Because you're watching the video. Um, and what I know to be true is that even with our best intended plans, you know, like we're going to have this great, um, you know, cookie baking experience, or we're going to go visit, why do I know visit our favorite outdoor space because there's nothing else that we're allowed to do right now. For those of you who are in lockdown quarantine, um, you know, you, you get there and kids complaining, um, one child's angry at the other, and then is inconsolable. You know what I'm talking about. And my big news of 2021, drum roll please, is that not only was I able to see my 22 and 24 year old, my stepkids who are now grown, one in college, one you know out starting her career, but I also have a new six year old in my life who has joined my household. So I'm in it with you guys, <laughs> friends, folks, I'm in it with you um, on the daily, <laughs> I'm back in it. <laughs> and so, yeah, from, you know, not getting what you want and having a tantrum or having to navigate, um, you know, so what does socializing look like in the quarantine? Um, we had tons of mischief and giggles because, you know, two children who had been pretty much socially isolated got together um, in our bubble over here for the first time in, you know, weeks, even months. And my gosh, <laughs> some of the mischief that they got into when they were left alone. So I'm in it with you. And so I'm going to dive right into these questions here. Um, one, one that stood out to me right away is, you know, how do I motivate my child to join physical activities? How many of you are listening, you know, whether you're listening to the recording or you're here live with me on Facebook or in Zoom, how many of you are also experiencing it, like even yourself being, you know, less motivated or kind of struggling to incorporate physical activities? Right, because our kids are not, most of them, a lot of them are not going to childcare or are not going to preschool or not going to school where, you know, they have this natural transition from classroom to, to the yard and having time to play, et cetera. And so we're the ones often who are kind of co coaxing them out of the house and into outdoor play. Now, this is easy for you. Throw some tips into the chat, like what's worked for you? Let's, let's crowdsource, let's brainstorm together um, so we can find out, you know, what, <laughs> what's working for you and we can sh idea share. But here are some things that I've heard. So first of all, if you, um, you know, kind of build on what's already worked. So if you have had any success during the pandemic, during this time, getting your child to do an outdoor activity, you know, the most obvious thing to kind of grab or reach for is to suggest that you do that same thing again. Around here, it's been practicing riding the bike on the flat, the flat greenway down the street has been really effective. And even though it's not the easiest thing to pull off, you know, the helmet, the bike, riding after, run, running alongside the bike, that's something that's been kind of our go-to around here because we know that it, it's motivating for our little one here. Um, another thing that you could consider is taking something that's been working and adding a twist to it. So a new element could be like, okay, yeah, we're gonna go to the park and we're going to, um, you know, collect some things from nature. I wonder how many pine cones we can find this time. So even if it's just one little point of interest that kind of gets them to go, oh, I'm curious too now, or I'm looking forward to that. For older kids, it can be about, you know, improving a skill. Sometimes kids like to feel like they're working towards something. So you could say, listen, I know we don't have in-person soccer right now, but we will someday soon. So why don't we go kick the ball around and you can really work on your passing and even um, you know, uh, some, some hard kicks into a goal to see if you can get past you know, goalie mom or goalie dad, goalie care provider, right? Whatever role you're playing. Um, and, so, and so then there's like this, this kind of um, extra layer of like challenge that builds some interest in. The other thing you can do is really manage your expectations of what you're going to achieve in your outdoor time. Because sometimes it's actually the opposite 
where you need to pull away from there being a big goal or a big aim that you're trying to achieve and just have it be about families going outside for 10 minutes and you just just kind of make it happen like what do we need to go outside we need shoes we need a, a rain jacket around here we've had some rain um, sunglasses some sunscreen we're going to do that and i'm just committing to 10 to 20 minutes i have this really smart client who was really trying to organize an hour a day outdoors and it was just not kind of translating to action from her her co-parent and her child um, they would resist it, they'd fight it, and pretty soon she just felt kind of discouraged. How many of you can relate, right? Um, just discouraged because they're they're putting in the good effort and yet it's not, you know, people, like it feels like pulling teeth, like she's dragging them out of the house. Well, she realized that one of the things that she needs to do, and this was after working with um, one of our coaches who is really great, Amani Aisha, at helping couples especially, but all people in relationship Kind of set uh, goals that are that 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 can actually motivate action, like your next step. So that instead of getting stuck in I don't know maybe even resentment or giving up, right? Um, you have a way forward. So one of the things that she she um, encouraged was well maybe you can have the same result with less time. And and maybe that really what we're trying to do is just create a habit of going outdoors. And it's really not about the full hour. It's not really about what happens during that hour. It's just, let's get outside for at least 15 to 20 minutes. And when she peeled back sort of the bigger expectation and just kind of set the goal a little bit in some ways broader, but also just like shorter, like a small step, um, less time, same, same outcome of going outdoors. Um, it, it became a lot more achievable and, and her daughter and her um, co-parent got, got more on board. So that's what I would say when it comes to motivating your child to join physical activities. Um, the other thing can be, and like, you know, I, I'm not always a huge proponent of putting kids in front of more screen time, but there are things like kid bop and um, cosmic yoga, like stuff like that, that if you look up and just look at the ratings and see like, you know, if there's over a thousand views, it's probably pretty good. Um, and you know, screen it one one episode just to make sure it kind of fits your family culture. But a lot of them are actually really fun. Like the kids enjoy it, and it could even be an independent activity where they'll they'll want to move. Um, another thing you can do is if you've tried that and you, all of these things they're just refusing, you could say, look, you don't have to join in, but you need to be there. Because sometimes part of it is just not being unfamiliar with it or they're just resistant because you told them to do it and they are an independent little spirit. <laughs> so you might even just suggest, hey, look, you don't have to participate, you don't have to join in, but I need, you need to be there. So maybe like, <laughs> you know, they turn on, turn on the video and the sibling does it, but they get to just, they get to sit and watch and that's okay as a first step. So you're kind of breaking it down into smaller steps and stepping into participation. So hopefully that's giving you some ideas. And this was for, I meant to mention, um, yeah, like I always like to say who who asked the question so that you can find this part. Um, so let's see, this one was from Kimberly Flores. No, 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 sorry. Let's see, this is um, Hang, uh, Hang Tran. I hope I said your name correctly. Please correct me if I didn't. Uh, Hang Tran, this part's for you. This is your question. And I'm wondering, you know, if you're listening in, I see a few folks here. Um, first of all, say hi. Let me know you're here, um, where you're tuning in from. If you don't drop a comment, I, I can't tell you who's here. So go ahead and do that. And then I can, I can um, also answer any questions you might have. Um, but even if you don't have a question, just you know, say a little hello, that'd be great. And I'm just gonna tag Hong, Hong John so she knows um, that I just answered her question. So moving on to the next one. Um, and again, if you pop up questions, I will prioritize yours. Um, so say hello and introduce yourself. Um, we have, how do I deal with my child's anger towards me? Mm, that's always so hard. Um, and him being mean to other kids when he gets upset or his feelings are hurt. Such a good question. Oh, Jennifer's back. Jennifer, my Star Monday student. So glad you're here. And you get to come to a month of mentorship since you won the grand prize in our last challenge. Awesome, so glad you're here. And Emilio's here, yay! One of my uh, immersion clients who's studied with me for a year and is, and is gonna be with me for another six months. So excited to have you both here. Um, say hello to each other, you're both in the immersion. <laughs> um, and local, you're both local to the East Bay. Um, so this next question, so anger is hard. And Emilio, you, you've got some stuff on this, I'm sure. Because <laughs> we have to, it's really tricky to, um, 
to not take it personally. First of all, knowing like having some part of you that can embrace the fact that kids get angry. They just, they do, they get angry and kind of rightfully so with everything that's been going on. Like they, life is not meeting their basic expectations a lot of the, a lot of, a lot of the time right now. Um, and so just, you know, kind of feeling into the, like how developmentally appropriate, um, and also like what, you know, what you can relate to in it. Um, and even if it's about you, like, it's really not about you. I'm going to say that again, even if it seems like it's about you, it's really not about you. And we go over this in our emotional mastery piece. So one of the things we'll be talking about in our three-day training, um, which we do twice a year, um, this one's going to be about emotional mastery. We talk about how, you know, emotions come from somewhere and anger in particular is usually around, um, you have something I want and you won't give it to me. And sometimes it's not even a thing. It's like, maybe it's access to the, the iPad, right? Um, maybe it's, um, saying no to a play date because you're being more cautious than, than the other family, right? You just decide like it's taking a break from play dates. You're like withholding something from them. Um, it could even be like a, even an idea, like you won't agree, why won't you agree with me? <laughs> like withholding agreement. And oftentimes we are reasonably doing this thing or we're asking them to do something and um, they get angry. And what kids are doing, and this is all different ages, right? So young kids are figuring out the basics of power, of power dynamics. They want to know who's in charge, who's making the rules, what are the rules. And so one of the things we can do is just be as consistent and upfront as possible. And that can often put kids in a position where at least they intellectually understand why things are the way they are and why you might be reinforcing something that they don't like but they kind of get that that's the, the like the lay of the land. So you might want to look at setting limits and and what what you have set up and what you are maybe like unclear about or haven't been able to be consistent about. Parents will underestimate the power of that taking the time to establish what kids need to take care of around the house is wildly helpful. Amelia, you could probably weigh in on this too. <laughs> um, and Jennifer too, right? We talked about what it's like to preview and explain things ahead of time, especially if it's a recurring pattern, how much that can help with that anger or that resistance later, because I mean, unless they have a really good reason to be angry, um, usually we're asking for reasonable things. You know, um, if it's COVID related, it's more of like a coping conversation, right? Of like acknowledging how things are different and harder acknowledging the wishes and wants that are not being fulfilled, getting curious about how to fill those needs other ways temporarily, um, and having an open dialogue about that. And that's especially useful with older kids. So Sarah Kowalski, I hope we've um, started to answer your question. When you come over and navigate to this and you hear your part, um, let me know what your follow-up thoughts or questions are. Same with, um, with Hung, okay? I'd love to hear, hear what you think about these ideas. And maybe you're like, I've tried that already. I know, um, <laughs> Amelia, we were at the, like, you know, like, over a year ago, we were at this retreat and I was like, listen, there's gonna be moments where I say something and you're gonna say, I've already tried that. That doesn't work with my kid. And I'll go, interesting, good, let's talk more. <laughs> like that's that's what I, I'm like, ooh, let's, this is more complicated. Let's figure this out together. And if you're having an experience in hearing this, you know, one of the best things you can do is take my parent discovery quiz and get really clear about what, what are the things that are like, you know, yeah, but what about my kid? Here's what happens. Jennifer's taken it, Amelia's taken it. So this is really for folks who maybe haven't had a chance to take it yet. There's also an opportunity to apply for a strategy session where I can get you some specific ideas. And Amelia and Jennifer had very powerful ones. I remember where you walked away with something you could try right away and it helped, it worked. So um, yeah, I really encourage you to take me up on that. I have several spots open this month. So back to the questions. Um, and Emilio and Jennifer, if you have something, shoot it, shoot it um, into the comments. Like, shoot, you know, let me know what, they, what it is. Um, in the meantime, I have somebody asking, how do I get my child to sleep at bedtime? My gosh, it's such a big topic, so important, has so much going on with it, um, especially 
Kimberly Flores, you, you were interested in the mood management. So what I'm guessing here, and I wish you were here live, but um, maybe you can follow up with me in the comments here. What I'm curious to know is what, what have you tried and what, how does, he, how does um, he or she respond, your child respond, um, your, your son? Um, and like, what is this mood management piece? Like, is he mad at you? Is he um, kind of just generally grumpy? Um, Cause I'd want to look at a few things. Um, but the first place to look always is, you know, is this routine working for him? Like, is it really working for him? Has he, is he on board with what the routine is for bedtime? Oftentimes that's the precursor to having a pleasant bedtime <laughs> is having a routine that, that is really supports his needs and that he is on board with. So that's where I'd start with you. Um, that would be my first inquiry, my first question. Um, besides like what you've already tried. And because I've seen dramatic results with shifting your routine, you know, like, and, and the difference is, I mean, you get so much time back, hours of time back. And sometimes it takes some sleep training, even for older kids. Um, I've worked with a parent with a eight-year-old, an 11-year-old, a six-year-old, a four-year-old in the last three months around sleep training and how to get kids more on board with the sleep schedule. So I'd wanna look at some of those strategies and techniques. Um, here's an example, one that some of you've heard of, but not, not everybody, is that you, um, you know, if your child is really used to you sitting at them and then they throw a fit when you leave, one of the things you can do is you can phase out of sitting with them slowly and it's called taking breaks. And you basically take breaks during that sitting time, letting the child know like, you'll be right back. And you can make them 30 seconds to five minutes and you always come back. And the hope is that they'll get used to you being out of the room while they kind of soothe themselves and, and start to, um, you know, kind of downregulate for the day. And eventually they'll fall asleep on their own. And what you do is you, so you let them know that they're like, oh, I need to go check on the oven or, oh, I need to just, I need, I, I heard something happen. I'm going to go see what that is. I'll be right back. Um, I need to take a bathroom break, but I'll be right back. And when you come back, if they're still awake, you could just say something really simple, like, wow, you look so, so tucked in and so cozy. And, you know, you did really well on your own. Good job, hon. And then, and then go back to sitting really quietly next to them um, while, while they're, while they're, you know, attempting to sleep. Um, so, I'd want to get into some sleep training strategies potentially, but especially look at the routine building up to it. Um, because even the whole day's routine, it could be that dinner starts too late and bedtime happens too late. I have one client that we've been struggling with that one for some, some months because it's just harder to get the dinner happening earlier. And she's like really recommitting to, um, you know, child always eats, she's got a three-year-old now, um, child always eats by six. Because <laughs> if not, then we get into this like, Kind of twilight hour that turns into more of like a twilight zone. <laughs> um, so that's for you, Kimberly. Let me know what you think about that. Tell me more. Um, I've got, how do I stay calm when I'm tired um, so that I don't start yelling at my kids? This is such a big one too, and so important. And I can see why this became, you know, your top question. Um, and this is from, let me see. Uh, Michelle Klobasa, Michelle, I just so admire this question because first of all, you're just willing to be that self-aware to say like, if I were calmer when I'm, when I'm tired, then I probably wouldn't yell as much. And um, we spend six day, we have like a six day training with two master classes afterward, you know, several times a year right here in the Raising Resilience Parent Group. So invite your friends <laughs> to join in this community so they can have access to it. Um, we have you know, several strategies and different ones work for different people, including for our kids. Like not everybody, every kid is gonna be a take three deep breaths kid. You know, so for some kids, they look at you like you're crazy <laughs> when you tell them that. Others, it's gonna be their place of Zen. They'll be able to return to it time and time again. Same with adults. Um, I know for me, somatic tools are my most effective. Um, I'm a very embodied person. So, you know, using a tense and release tool in the moment and just sort of training my muscles that when you, when I feel tense, like I might get really, you know, like I feel it, especially in my jaw and in between my shoulder blades that I, I take the time real quick to tense, tense, tense for at least 10 seconds and release it and kind of reset my whole like muscular nervous system, you know, the neuromuscular system. 
to say you don't have to hold that tension. And that actually signals to my brain, which signals to all of the neurochemistry that it's okay to downregulate. I don't actually need to escalate. Because often what's happening when we're tired is we feel less resourced and have lower capacity to cope. And when that happens, we tend to go push, we get pushed into um, you know, higher, higher states that um, are, have like this uh, fight, flight, faint, freeze kind of quality to them where we're, we're no longer really feeling in charge, right? Like we have this kind of overwhelming frustration that takes over and becomes yelling and you know, expressed anger. So there's that. So somatic tools, breathing tools, but there, it, breathing is being one of them, um, and tense and release. But there's also a lot of ways to just sort of like work on your mindset, and that usually takes more time. But here's one that's great. Um, so again, one of my coaches um, likes to say <laughs> on my team, she's a tiny human, like honor that. You know, he's a tiny human, just honor that. And for me, I like to say that limited life experience. <laughs> Like this 10 year old is having an unreasonable reaction to something. I'm tired and frustrated about it, but like limited life experience, like lots to learn, you know, lots to learn here. And then I tend to have a follow up question. Do I want to teach this lesson right now or should I choose a different battle? Like, do I move on? And so there's all these ways you can use self-talk, whether it's through self-emotion coaching, self-motivation coaching, or reframing things in a way that's helping you tune into their developmental sort of trajectory that can help you stay calmer in the moment. I also want to speak to getting moments of rest where you're not in task mode. And this is like uh, author Rachel Amara, author of the book Pause, who I had on, you know, several months ago in November as a guest speaker. And she had me on her, you know, her Monday talk or Friday talk. Um, she was just really talking about how we can shift our nervous system in as little as one to five minutes um, out of task mode into nurture mode where we're actually able to receive some rest. And it's all about saying, turn off the task mode and turn up the like self-care self -care mode. And it could even be like giving yourself a squeeze and just like receiving that. It could be listening to a song all the way through while you close your eyes. And I know this sounds sort of cheesy or like silly, but you build in 10 moments like that, start with maybe one and then build up to like five to 10 moments like that throughout your day, your nervous system will thank you and reward you because you will have more energy to kind of draw from when your patience is being tested the most. And there's more to look at there, but Michelle, I wanted to give you some things to start with and let us know, what do you think? Um, those of you who are listening, there's three of you. I know Emilio and Jennifer are here, but if there's one more person who wants to introduce themselves, say hello, let me know you're here. That'd be great. Um, so I have another one, which is, how do I get on the same page as my family when it comes to listening and cooperating? First of all, how wise for you to say same page? Because it's one of the top things that folks end up in my world about. Like, the, I think because we all understand the difference of what happens when we're on the same page and when we're not on the same page. Like we can really feel it. Um, and this is, this reminds me of Bridget. I think this is from Bridget and I think Ashley Dwyer who's anticipating this for the future. So we've got Bridget Westlake asking this really smart question. Um, and Bridget, we're gonna be connecting later this week um, about your four kids. Um, and then we have Ashley as well. And one of the things that I always um, encourage folks to do is, you know, find some common ground to start on. So what do you notice that both you and the other parent or care provider, whether it's grandma, aunt, nanny, you know, roommate or otherwise, um, what do, what do you both seem to um, agree needs to be addressed in terms of listening and cooperating? So, um, for example, like when you want to intervene, this is usually some low, low hanging fruit, like the easy one, when, when to intervene if it looks like somebody might get physically hurt, like that's often one that people agree about. They, they're like, we need to, like something, we need, we need to uh, reinforce the limit, get involved, um, separate the kids or something, right? Because, you know, I know you have siblings in your world, Bridget. Um, 
to, to ensure that safety, you know, safety first, like we, if we can have some hurt feelings, whatever, but we're, we're gonna, we're gonna get involved. Um, so trying to find some common ground to build from because oftentimes the reason why getting on the same page as a family comes up is because you have concerns because there have been several ways that it's been challenging to get on the same page. So I would build from your strengths as a place to start. Usually we can find one thing. So that's one thing I advise all my clients to do in this kind of getting on the same page piece. Um, the other thing is to have regular regular conversations, excuse me, I just wanna move something. Um, regular conversations about raising kids. And um, like I give, I give um, all of my parents this kind of list of questions to guide a conversation. Emilio's gotten it, Jennifer, you know, if you stay with me for the year, yeah, you'll have it too. It's this list of questions that I think, you know, the research has shown that if parents have a chance to talk through, you'll at the very least surface things that are maybe challenges down the road or already challenges, but then you'll also build in some compassion for why. Like why, why do you think that we should let the kids work it out every time, even if they get into physical fights? And why do I wanna intervene as soon as it seems like there's just you know, um, some, some unrest between you know, some potential conflict? Those are really different. Well, what did you, what model did you grow up with? What model did I grow up with? How are we responding to that? You know, and having these like kind of meaningful conversations. So you can go deep into that and that can be so revealing and can be so meaningful and bonding actually between care providers and start to realize that there's a reason behind the actions or inactions of people and it's less frustrating because you see where they're coming from and can maybe even find something to agree with about the way that another person is approaching things. Um, the other thing is to have regular conversations about parenting, like I was mentioning, by establishing a weekly or even bi-weekly meeting where you come together and you actually like have a have a have a huddle, have like a team huddle, right? And in some in some spaces, some worlds they call this a family meeting. I mean, I, I refer to it as a family meeting, but family meetings can look so many different ways. And you know, just last month I gave uh, templates to my clients about um, how to run a successful family meeting. And um, I had this parent of, you know, of several children, <laughs> not, not too different from yours, Bridget, in terms of ages, actually, um, and challenges, um, brought, brought the agenda that she had, just, she had just gotten from the training and just ran a meeting and like just did it. And the next thing you know, she, her two little ones are like, putting their chore, chore ideas into a jar, right? She's putting in there and they're picking them and going, yay, I got water the plants. Everyone's like, yay, I got dust the, dust the shelves or whatever. And then they, and they go skip off and did it. And she took photos and shared it with the group. And we're all like, wow, amazing, right? Um, a solution that came from this little family meeting format that was not too hard to run. And sometimes I think we, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to know what to do in the moment and always do it right when really like we can step back and like a good coach or a mentor, like a true leader, which we are in our families by default, by having the most life experience and access to cars and <laughs> the car and you know credit cards or whatever, however you wanna define it. We are just in positions of influence and power. Um, how to step into that in a way that's really um, motivating and captivating and you feel like you're on the moving forward together. So. That's the vision and one meeting at a time, one sort of investigation of where do we overlap and where do we differ at a time and it builds. You know, I've seen this build over months or even years with some of the folks that have worked with me and it's significant. Like if I had shared a recording of their current family meeting with them when we first started working together, like, you know, before they kind of embraced this idea, um, I think that they would have been in disbelief. Like there's no way we can have that kind of conversation with our three, six and 10 year old. No way, you know, especially not our 12 year old. Like there's no way she'll, she would even be at that, in, in that, at that table, but you know what? It happened. <laughs> so I would encourage you to consider a, a regular meeting to at least just have conversations about your, well, what's, what's happening in your family, some concerns. Um, maybe even just the inquiry like where, what can we agree on? 
and how and how how are, how are we noticing we're approaching things differently and not making it a problem, making it a discovery process. So that's where I'd, I'd point you to Bridget and Ashley. I would and both of you, I would just love for you to have like a robust structure to go forward with that. So let's talk. We're, we're talking Wednesday, Bridget and Ashley. Let's talk before the baby arrives. So I'd be really curious about um, supporting you even before baby's here. You know. Um, so again, if you're here watching and, and um, either the recording or if you're here, um, you know, live, just say hello in the comments. And I'm staying on for a little bit here to address any questions that came up. And it doesn't have to be a new question. It can be completely related to something I just shared, um, or it could be completely different. Um, I'm open, you know, I, I really kind of address all of the foundational things that families need to build a resilient family, whether it's setting limits on screen time or running a effective bedtime routine or solving, like helping kids have more problem solving skills so they can do it more on their own. And they're not just always going mom or dad or, you know, grandma and or whatever, come over here and fix this for me. You name it, I've done it. <laughs> um, and have helped hundreds of families. I'm currently serving dozens of families um, in private practice and in our year long immersion. And um, if for some reason you haven't yet heard about my year long immersion and you're super curious, another reason to take the parent discovery quiz because it'll help both of us assess if it's a good fit for you to spend, spend 2021 with me. I would, I'd be honored to help you if it's a good fit to build all the skills and tools and strategies to have more resilience in your family. I show up for my people like nobody's business. Emilio can tell you, um, once, you're, once you're in our Raising a Resilience Immersion family, like I'm, I'm in your court, I'm, I'm, I'm in your corner, I'm there, I'm there giving you specific things to say and do if you need that level of support, right? when your child melts down, when your child refuses to get on board with a, a rule, when your child doesn't wanna do their virtual learning, like we can map out a whole plan for how to approach it um, in our immersion and, and in our sessions. So if this is appealing to you, if you feel called, like don't hesitate, take the quiz, get on and, and request to have a session with me. Um, we're starting our first cohort um, on Thursday and we have rolling admissions for um, until early February, but it's best for you to just hop in as soon as possible so that you can um, kind of ride the wave of momentum from the new year uh, with, with the other families that are, are dedicating 2021 to making major changes and shifts in their family. So if that appeals to you, please don't hesitate. Um, and I'll put that link in just in case anybody missed it. Other than that, folks, this is wrapping up our Ask Me Anything. Um, I don't see any new questions, but you can always feel free if you're listening to the recording to just pop it in the comments. Um, and I would be happy to jam with you right here in the comments thread. Um, oftentimes people will throw a question up and next thing you know, they're coming back to me and be like, I tried the thing you said, you know, or they'll come to one of my workshops and be like, I went home and did it and it worked. <laughs> it's just so fun um, because it doesn't have to be really hard. It doesn't have to be really hard. It can even be enjoyable to like, figure out some of the, the tougher parts of parenting. And it's so much more fun when we do it together. And even more so when you have support, you know, someone in your corner who really, really can see and has seen, <laughs> can see where you're going and has seen others get there too. So let's ride this uh, wave into 2021 together. Come back Mondays at 2 p.m. I'll be back for with a motivation series. That's a kind of a mini version of my longer motivation workshop. Um, so you can get little tips along the way this month as you're staying motivated to stay on your New Year's goals, um, especially ones for your family. And uh, we'll, we'll be seeing you here in the group. Emilio I'll, and Jennifer, I'll see you Thursday at our immersion training. And Bridget, I'll see you Wednesday. And um, the rest of you, let me know if you need anything or go ahead and hop over and take that quiz. All right, bye for now. And if you didn't say hello yet and you want to let me know you're here, go ahead and put your name into the comments and uh, let me know. I'm going to refresh this just to make sure I one of my workshops and be like, I went home. And okay, we're good. We're complete. All right. Lots of love to you all. Until next time. See you next Monday.